No. Hello, I'm Julia Widdop with Talk Story TV, and today I have author Tim Rose with me. He's the author of Fearless Puppy on the American Road, and he's going to tell us more about his book and the project that it's supporting. Go ahead, Tim. How you doing? Good. 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 The the name is Ten. T E N. Ten. Yep. And uh, actually, a lot of people ask about that, so I might as well start. It's in the Fearless Puppy book. But Tenzin Karma Trinley is the full name. And I thought that was way too much of a mouthful for people to try to pronounce. I thought it was pretty rude to tell people call me that, you know? Yeah. So that Ten is like a nice shortened version of it there. When you go through certain Buddhist initiations, they give you a name, a uh, oh. Tibetan Buddhist name that goes with that. And this happened to me back in 1981. So uh, I, I like the name. I mean, they always give you a name to live up to. They don't ever give you a name like idiot who throws up on his own shoes. You know, it's always <laughs> something like very uplifting that you're supposed to point towards. And mine is the activity of the Buddha teaching. Oh, and so, that's what that word means? That's what Tenzin Karma Trinley means, the activity of the Buddha teaching, but uh, it's too much. But I like it because it reminds me to be a little bit less of an idiot sometimes, you know. <laughs> it's hard to walk around like with a name like activity of the Buddha teaching and then go do something stupid. So I try to keep it, but of course it's too long. So the shortened version is 10. So that's where that name comes from. Okay. And uh, that's in the Fearless Puppy book which tells about 35 years of road travel, hitchhiking, basically. Oh, okay. Uh, I've still never driven a car in my life, and I'm 61 now. You've never driven a car in your life? No, and I don't think I ever will. As a 15-year-old drug dealer in Brooklyn, New York, when I was growing up, uh, well, first of all, in the city, you don't need a car. It's a right. disadvantage to have one. But uh, then at 15, I figured out uh, this isn't going to last too long. You know, there's people dying all over the place. And I've had drug dealing in anywhere is bad. Yeah. But if you do it in New York City, it gets worse. So I figured to get out, I just said enough of this, started hitchhiking out. And it worked out so well, I kept hitchhiking for 35 years after that. 35 years. Yeah. Yeah, I just uh, slowed down recently. I really can't do it anymore, you know. It's hard carrying those 100-pound duffel bags around. Um, yeah. So that this is the story of your travels? Uh, and, uh, excuse me, and the people that I meet along the way. Right. Oh, wow, that is fabulous. <laughs> it's mostly the stories of them and the... Uh, the people I meet along the way, <clears throat> excuse, have a pretty wide range. Uh, they run for the several Tibetan lamas mentioned in their Native American wise men. There's also uh, hookers and heroin addicts and, <laughs> uh, and every variety of weird thing you can think of. One thing I tell folks about a story that's in there, there's about 80 little chapters in there and each one tells about a different adventure or person that I met. And when I told people about the all-lesbian rock and roll band that played a concert for deaf people, they don't believe me, but it's a true An story. An all-lesbian rock and roll band playing a concert for deaf people? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I was there. How did I, that work? <laughs> uh, it was incredible. I mean, the story is in the book, but I met these women who were in the band, and they worked at a deaf school. Uh, now, these were people who had been able to hear at one point in their life and lost their hearing. So it's not like they were without a frame of reference or a touchstone for what sound was. Okay. Very sensitive with their other senses so they can feel the vibrations actually in the ground and in the air around them and everything. They can see the motions of the people. And they were up and down. They were more on beat dancing than a lot of people I've seen who can hear perfectly well. <laughs> <laughs> really coordinated sense of rhythm. Uh, I, I was real nervous when they dropped me off with a couple of their friends who were students at the school. 
and said, hey, you sit with them, you'll have a good time. Yeah. And I'm um, watching the concert while they're up there playing. And I didn't know what, you know, how do you have a say anything? To, and by the end of the evening, I knew their kids, how many they had, what ages, what happened to them in an accident, uh, and all about their lives, and they knew all about mine. Somehow, just between like sign language and a little bit of lip reading that they could do, which was not all together, but some, but uh, just signs and motions and, and body language. I mean, they're so adept at, at having their other sensibilities pick up for the hearing loss that uh, it, it was almost as smooth as any conversation between two people who can both hear and speak. Wow. That's so, amazing. And, yeah, that was quite amazing. And, and you that, met them hitchhiking. Right, right. I got picked up by the women who were in the band Uh huh. and ended up uh, going to the concert with them later. And that's really not the most amazing story in the book either. What's I mean, the most somebody, amazing one? I don't know if there is one. <laughs> I mean, so, you know, because some of these experiences with the Tibetan lamas and going to their teachings there... It's uh, it, it's so beyond words that it's kind of hard to describe. Oh, okay. But I managed somehow, and I, I, I wrote a second book that's about living in a Buddhist temple where nobody spoke the language, and that's completely a book about you know conversation without words. This fearless puppy has some elements of that in it. Uh huh. And uh, it, it was good training for writing the second one because to write about silence is uh, not the easiest thing. I mean, that was the biggest challenge for me. It's just know? finding the words to express something that has no words. Right, exactly. Exactly. How do you express a no words? Or, but you can work around it. We got, we got it done, I think. I haven't had any complaints about it anyway. Uh -huh. so, uh, so, yeah, that's basically what the book is about uh, as travels along and all these people that I met during the course of it uh, the most important part of the, the books both of them actually and especially the first one uh, I'm not an author <laughs> I mean I guess I am now. yes you are <laughs> yes, I am now but uh, I accidentally from what people tell me I accidentally wrote some great books without you know basically I was trying to fund a charity project all right this whole thing is not about the books as much as it's about the project to fund wisdom professionals, beginning with Tibetan monks and nuns and their causes, but not exclusive to them. There are other wisdom professionals, you know, that, that need funding as well. And so it's all about that. And I figured my odds, I mean, the odds of selling a million books are not that much better than the odds of winning the lottery. But I figured they were a little bit better. A little so bit better. Of, yeah. So instead of going out and, and getting like bazillion dollars worth of lottery tickets, I figured I'd try the book writing thing. And uh, it did actually accidentally. I've gotten all good reviews and people love it. I've had people tell me that they've read stuff in there that has helped them to change their lives for the better and all of this, which is a lovely ancillary benefit. I mean... Yeah. Really, I was just planning to try to fund the project is also. Now, tell us more about the project. What will it do? Uh, there's a lot of, we, we as humans, for whatever reason, have always been more ready to throw our resources into the defensive, aggressive type of actions that we perform. All right. Mm -hmm. We got no trouble throwing a million bucks into a million, a billion bucks into a war effort. Trillions, yeah. yeah trillions. And we have a, a lot of trouble, you know, just making sure kids have school lunches and books in their schools and, and that they're eating and uh, they, they get their health care and that people are taken care of right here. Yes. So uh, wisdom professionals are one of the groups of people that have fallen victim to this, I'd call it a perverse mentality, where you're funding all the negative things, that's where all your money and resources are going, and all the positive things end up being ignored. 
So, I mean, I was over in uh, Southeast Asia for half a year living in a monastery. I was in a pretty good neighborhood, but I know of some of the other places. And the people there were just living on rice, white rice, not exactly a storehouse of vitamins. Now, the monks and nuns are also living on white rice. And uh, they have enough privations in their life. I mean, they do without things that you and I would consider necessities. Yeah. Much luxury. You know, they don't eat after noon. They don't have any sex. They wear one thing or clothes, and that's what they wear as that robe, you know. Uh, they, they have to follow a whole lot of strict regimens, and these are all perfect for what they're doing, which is to raise their consciousness to the highest level so they can bring their intuition to the forefront and help as many people as possible in any circumstance possible. That's their job description. Okay. Right? Their job description is to be compassionate and care for whoever and whatever they can. Now, why a person like that has to scrap for food and medical attention when uh, a war effort or a ball player is getting a million dollars, you know, yeah. 10 million a year or whatever it is, it just seems like uh, an absurd travesty of justice to me. So that's what this is all about, is to raise funds to sponsor an increase in the number of wisdom professionals. All right, okay. now, I only care for the ones who are there, but I mean, anybody who's read a newspaper recently knows that there's that stupidity is running rampant. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Stupidity is just running rampant. I mean, people are running around doing, nobody does these things on purpose. Nobody is miserable on purpose. Nobody is greedy. Nobody is nasty, wants to hurt other people, hurt themselves. They don't do this on purpose. They do it because of ignorance and because of stupidity and bad programming that they've received over the years that tells them this is normal. Yeah. So my idea is that the more wisdom professionals we have, and this, of course, includes a lot more than the monks and the nuns I'm talking about, it, it, uh, I hope to spread it further, but the more wisdom professionals we have around, the more that stupidity will decrease, the more that people will have a chance to actually be the kind of happy that they want to be. Because, again, any human being wants to be happy and has the right to be happy. It's just that they've gotten so many mixed messages and, and confused programming and negative input that they don't know what happy is anymore or how to get there. Or never knew. <laughs> or never knew exactly, because if you're born in the middle of that stream of consciousness, you don't even know that there's a bank on either side you can swim to. You just think that's it. I mean, if you can't see anything else from where you are, yeah, that, that's what life is to you. So with an increase in wisdom professionals, there will be more people who, you know, and these folks can reach millions of people at a time. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can reach just one person in their little teeny village, but a lot of times they make videos and, and recordings, and a lot of people get to hear them, and they do a lot of folks a lot of good. So that's the idea behind the project, and uh, the books are what I hope will be able to fund that project. Great. And where could someone buy your book, uh the Fearless uh, Puppy on American Road. Uh, it's um, about to be available wherever anyone asks for. Right now, at the website, www, they're all www, right? <laughs> yes. Fearless, fearlesspuppy.org. That's .org. Fearlesspuppy.org. And that has sample chapters from the Fearless Puppy book. It has sample chapters from the new book. It has reviews, author bio, which is kind of funny because I'm in some newspaper articles for doing other projects like wearing a cardboard box for a homeless project that I did. And so there's kind of amusing stuff there. There's uh, other interviews on there and uh, reviews of the book. And yeah, there's all kinds of stuff there. But there is also a buy button. Okay. So if you want either the ebook version or the printed version, you can just go right there to the website, push the button, 
it goes right to Amazon and Smashwords, and uh, it's a done deal. All right. Okay. And, well, go ahead and tell us a little bit about your next book, your upcoming book. That one is called Reincarnation Through Common Sense, and that'll be ready within a month or two. I mean, it's pretty much written. It just has to go through the processes that books have to go through before right. they get you know, typeset and all of that stuff. So uh, within a month or two, that one's about, it's also a true story. A Fearless Puppy on American Road is pretty much a true story, but I had to amend it a little bit. And there's, uh, it, it's explained in the introduction that my memory, because the stuff <laughs> I went there, you know, not only it was over a course of 35 years, but at the time I was very heavily into sex and drugs and rock and roll. <laughs> Most of that period. And there's a lot of stuff that I just plain remembered wrong. You know, the exact facts aren't always there. Uh, but it's basically a true story. And okay. reincarnation through common sense is even more so. That's almost to the letter a true story because it was written in a Buddhist temple in Southeast Asia. Mm. Now, the unusual part of the book, there's a lot of white boys in an Asian temple kind of books. But this one is about a guy who was rescued by the monks and nuns after a near-fatal incident went in there and had no no expectations or idea at all about studying spirituality or Buddhism or anything related. Uh, the guy was just, I'm saying the guy because I don't want to say it was me, but it was. Uh, I was <laughs> whacked out and uh, the monks and nuns do what they do. I mean, they are compassionate wisdom professionals. They had basically adopted me. I mean, the head monk spoke a little bit of English. We had a translator there. My friend came with me. And he said, uh, stay here. Don't worry about the Buddhism part. Uh, I'll be your older brother. The other monks and nuns will be like your brothers and sisters. That's your cabin over there. If you want to go swim at the beach and do whatever you want to do, go ahead. And if you want to join us for the meditations or the different things that we do, then you can do that. So uh, it's it's pretty unusual for a book of itself because it really, almost all of these type of books are about somebody who left the West to go to Asia on purpose to enter a temple to study Buddhism. They They're were really, actively seeking and you just kind of got hit on the head with it. I was a psychotic <clears throat> ambler happened to wander into a golden situation. <laughs> And uh, really, that's what happened, and, and it made it so, so different. I mean, I could actually say I wasn't there trying to fulfill the requirements of the position. Like, you're studying this, so you have to do that, 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 that. Yeah. I, I didn't have to do anything I didn't want to do. And, uh, and, and that one is, is even more of that, like, talking about silence thing, because... None of the monks and nuns spoke any English, and I didn't speak the language there. So, and the head monk spoke a little bit of English, but he was on the road a lot because he was a very popular guy and had to go give lectures and do different functions in other places. So basically, I'm sitting there with a dozen monks and nuns that don't speak my language. I don't speak theirs. I'm out of my mind. I'm not studying Buddhism. They're very much in their right minds and studying the Buddhism. And uh, it, it turned into a pretty interesting, to say the least, experience. There. Yeah, so that, I can't wait yeah. to read it. It sounds like, so you learned by watching them. Yeah, yeah, and not even by, it's just in the air. I mean, it's almost by osmosis, which is really, I mean, it sound, it's not as weird as it sounds because... We get programmed by watching television and by what we hear from school and church. And all these things are sources of information that are input to us. And then we take that attitude on with us. We keep most of it. We throw off the worst parts, hopefully. And, uh, and that's what happened to me. I was there and just by these people being who they were, they didn't have to actively try to do anything except be. <laughs> yeah, and you just 
They, and, and you can feel that. You can really feel that. I mean, you've walked into a room before and everybody's friendly and having a good time and it feels good. And then you've walked into a room like right after somebody's had a real big argument. You can like they got that expression. You can cut the air with a knife. The tension was so thick, you know. Yeah. And it, it works both ways. So if you're in a completely blissful situation, that stuff is soaking into you yeah. as well. You know, if you're in a nasty situation, you feel that. Nobody has to says, say a word to you. You know something bad just happened in this room. It feels tense in here or something. Exactly the opposite of that was the case at that temple. So I was, like, constantly being exposed to that, and that pretty much alone brought me back to sanity. Wow. You know? How wonderful. So, yeah, I did it. So that was an interesting book. Fearless Puppy is more fun, I would say, because uh, it bounces to all these different places and there's all these different people. And it's more like, you know, it's not like real life for most people. I wouldn't say that, but it's more like <laughs> real life than living in a Buddhist temple for half a year in a place where they don't speak the language. Right. Yeah. So and so it's a little more like uh, a rolling party, if you will. That fearless puppy book, like uh, Jack Kerouac's book. And it said some people have made that reference. Yeah, they said if Kerouac did 500 more tabs of acid and you put them in a blender with Deepak Chopra, that's what the, this book is like. <laughs> so, <laughs> blender with G. <laughs> okay, that's all right. Well, I can't wait to read it, and I have a copy, so I will read it. All right. And I encourage our listeners to read your book and um, hook up yeah. to your website. Yeah, again, that's uh, fearlesspuppy.org with the O-R-G at the end. And Fearless Puppy is spelled just like it sounds. And there's, uh, there's a whole lot of information there. That's, uh, you can um, amuse yourself for a couple of hours just going through that thing. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you, Julia. It's always a pleasure to see you. Bye. Bye.